Now when it comes to the strength of a bike wheel, it seems like the discussion is always centered around things like hub width, spoke count, and rim material. Now those are certainly important characteristics for any given wheel, but I think there's another variable that's equally valid, but not often discussed. In this video, a discussion on asymmetrical rims, in particular, what they are, why they exist, and whether or not you need some on your bike. Now, if you can imagine the profile of a rim that looks something like this, what you'll typically see is that the spoke holes are drilled down the center of the rim. Now, if you can picture that same wheel mounted in a bike frame, it might look something like this, where these little blocks here represent the frame or fork dropouts. Schematically, the hub would look something like this, with the hub flanges serving as the anchor point for the spokes. Now, for the moment, if we ignore spoke lacing patterns and just consider a radially laced symmetric wheel, yes very idealized, you can see that the two opposing spokes and the hub in between form a symmetrical isosceles triangle. Now this triangle is very strong and can resist large lateral forces at the apex like those experienced during hard cornering. Now if this were all there was to it, we'd just preserve the symmetry of the system and everything would be great. But of course, as we know, the flanges on a typical hub are not symmetric about the bike's center line. And the larger the cassette, or more specifically, the longer the free hub, the further inboard the drive side hub flange has to be. And then to a lesser extent, the non-drive side hub flange is also forced inboard on bikes with disc brakes. So in reality, the result may look something more like this. An isosceles triangle still, but much more acute, or let's just say skinnier. Now, what does this do to the lateral stiffness of the wheel? Well, to understand that, we need to briefly dig into a topic called vector statics, but not to worry, it's actually pretty straightforward. So let's just start with the basic idealized triangle, which corresponds to no cassette and no disc brakes. Now consider the lateral force being applied at the rim. Now in practice, this force could be the resultant force imparted on the wheel by the ground due to say a hard cornering event. Now with this in mind, we can actually calculate the amount of tension in each of the spokes. Now to do this, we just need to break down the force in each one of the spokes into their horizontal and vertical components. Now if the force F is pointing to the left as depicted here, then the spoke on the right will experience a tensile force T denoted by an arrow pointing away from the node, while the spoke on the left side will experience a compressive force C denoted by an arrow pointing toward the node. So breaking these forces down using some basic trigonometry gives us the following equation of static equilibrium in the horizontal direction, which is the only direction we need to consider right now. So for a fixed lateral force F, we can see that it's equal to C sine theta two plus T sine theta one. And I know it seems like it might be getting complicated, but just consider the following idea. Remember that F is fixed, so everything on the right side of this equation has to add up to the same value every time. Now, if either of the angles gets smaller, which is exactly what happens when we force the hub flanges inboard, then this sine of theta term also gets smaller, since the sine function is a monotonically increasing function between zero and pi over two. So if the sine term gets smaller when the angles themselves get smaller, the only way to preserve equality in this equation is for the tensile and compressive forces C and T to increase. Now that means for the same fixed applied lateral force F, the narrower the space between the hub flanges, the more tension and compression the spokes will experience. Now intuitively, you might have known this already to some degree, but let's just for a moment consider a hypothetical case where the spoke angles approach zero, and therefore the distance between the hub flanges also approaches zero. Now the sine of an angle that approaches zero also approaches zero, and so for the same applied lateral force F, we have a spoke tension or compression that mathematically approaches infinity. Now putting this another way, in this hypothetical scenario, the spokes would most certainly break before you could ever tension them high enough to resist even a small non-zero lateral force. What does all this have to do with asymmetric rims? Well, if we look at the more representative case where we do have to make space for the cassette and the rotor, then you can kind of see just how close the drive side spokes are to being vertical. Again, this is a case that we're trying to avoid because it requires such high tension in the spokes. Now, a theoretical solution to this problem would be to just move the rim over toward the non-drive side. Now, this would certainly help the situation by allowing the drive side spoke angle to be a little bit larger and hence reduce the required spoke tension. But we know that we can't actually do this because at the end of the day, the tire itself still needs to run along the center line of the bike. So instead, what some wheel and rim manufacturers do is to offset the rear wheel spoke drill line toward the non-drive side, which makes the drive side spoke angles a little bit larger, and overall this helps to balance the left and the right spoke angles, which yields a stronger and more laterally stiff wheel. And this is what's meant by an asymmetrical rim. It's an offset spoke drilling line that's meant to help equalize the drive and the non-drive side spoke tensions. 
Now interestingly, for the rear wheel, the asymmetry or the offset is generally biased toward the non-drive side because again, we're trying to get the drive side spoke angle as far from zero as possible. But for the front wheel, since there is no cassette and there's only a disc rotor, the asymmetry is actually biased toward the drive side for the very same reason. Now what we sketched out here was a very simple vector statics problem with your typical compressive and tensile forces. In reality, the spokes on a bike wheel are tensioned sufficiently high such that they're always in tension, even during cornering. But the conclusion that offsetting the spoke holes to equalize drive and non-drive side spoke tension is still valid. Okay, so what did we learn? The spoke holes on asymmetric rims are drilled off center, again, to help balance the left and the right spoke tension, thus producing a stronger, more laterally stiff wheel that's less prone to broken spokes. Okay, so since this is another bike science video, let's get to the viewer comments and questions. Let's see here, from Tim Jacobs. Excellent job, sauce. Thanks, Tim. From Mecca, oh boy. Mecca Takoyakasan, I have a question. What gearing would you consider too low that it's unusable? Oh, interesting question. Well, if you're strong and you're racing with no load, then the lowest gear ratio is actually probably gonna be pretty large. But if you're touring in a mountainous area with a bunch of gear on your bike, then obviously you're gonna need those low gears. As a blanket statement, the lowest usable gear ratio is probably one that allows you to spin at a comfortable cadence without going so slow that it's hard to keep your balance. From Thomas Grantham, what's your favorite local trail or ride? And are there any new to you trails that you hope to check out this year. I mean, we ride road, gravel, and mountain bikes, but if we're sticking to mountain bikes for now, then in SoCal, our favorites tend to be Santiago Oaks and Whiting Ranch. Now, as far as rides that I want to do, I've actually never been to Mammoth Bike Park, so that's definitely something that I'd like to do maybe this year. Tell us about your day job. How does it help you think about bicycles? Oh, okay. Well, many of you probably already know I am a professor of mechanical engineering. My specialty is in dynamic systems and control, but I'm definitely interested in other areas like mechanics, hence this vector statics video. I think just having a mechanical engineering background really helps me to think about bikes as systems and subsystems rather than just a thing with two wheels that you ride. Now I've actually got a cycling research group going on campus. We've been looking into things like modeling tires as spring damper systems, trying to develop a dynamometer for a drivetrain to quantify frictional losses. And we even had a group last year that went pretty deep into the design of suspension linkages for full suspension mountain bikes. Okay, so there you go. If you have questions for me, put them down in the comments and I'll pick a few more to answer in the next bike science video. Thanks again for watching and thanks for subscribing to the channel. If you haven't already, then I'll see you next time.